Welcome back to our third lecture in our series of lectures on basic macroeconomic relationships. In the previous two lectures, we introduced the relationship between disposable income, consumption, and savings, and that led us to the concepts of average propensity to consume and average propensity to save, and then more importantly, marginal propensities to consume and marginal propensity to save. And then we use the marginal propensity to consume and save to calculate the multiplier. And the economic concept of the multiplier is an extremely important idea because it, it, it explains how changes in investment spending by businesses or government spending have a magnified effect on the economy. So in, in the previous lecture, we, we investigated specific mathematical examples of this, supposing that, let's say, a business were to increase investment spending on new machines and equipment by $20, $20 billion, what would be the total effect on the economy, the total effect on GDP? So this particular section of lectures, we're going to explain what drives business decisions to increase or decrease the level of investment, or one, at least one of the basic relationships between um, what, what drives business investment. So, so the first idea here is expected rate of return. So any business, whether it's a small business or medium-sized business or large business, they're going to go through a series of different tests or, or, or checking different variables to estimate if they were to go down the road of a new project or start some new business venture, what would be their expected rate of return? So, uh, you know, a, a realistic example would say, let's, let, let's examine, say, Nike Corporation back in the 80s. They just made sneakers, right? And then they got Super Michael Jordan doing their uh, advertising, and all of a sudden, Know, they're rocking out, making all kinds of millions, billions of dollars on sneakers, and they, some uh, vice president or maybe somebody on the board of directors says, instead of just making sneakers, maybe we should get into athletic apparel. Well, before they just went and started making athletic apparel, they would, they would do all kinds of strategic investigations into things like what's competition like in that specific industry, in the athletic apparel industry. You know, what's the marketing cost? Uh, you know. What's the cost of production of a facility, whether they make it here domestically in the United States or somewhere else? What would be shipping costs? Well, you know, how many how many companies compete in that industry, right? So this is something you'd actually cover in like a finance class or a marketing or management class, right? So you'd put all those variables in, into some algorithm and you'd come up with some expected rate of return. So a reasonable expected rate of return on, on typical business ventures is somewhere around eight to nine percent. You know, sometimes better, sometimes a little bit worse, right? But so as economists, we're just going to assume that the expected rates of return that were calculated through this rigorous process of, of all you know the management and the marketers and the advertisers and the, you know, the vice president, we're going to assume that these expected rate of returns are, are, are rather accurate for our model. Right? So we're going to weigh the expected rate of return versus the real rate of interest. Right? So the real rate of interest is something we covered in a previous lecture, if you remember back to our study of of inflation, we said, okay, how did we get the real rate of interest? It's simply the nominal or stated rate minus an expected rate of inflation. So if you know, if you were to get a, a car loan and the car loan say is for five years at six percent, and you expect inflation to range about two percent over that over that time, then the real rate of interest is simply six percent minus two percent or four percent. Right. So what businesses will do is they'll weigh the expected rate of return on some new business project, right, investing in new machines, equipment, tools, manufacturing facilities, versus the real rate of interest. Right? So the real rate of interest is the cost of borrowing for a business. Right? So you know, in our simple example, we said, OK, what if Nike Corporation, after all their tests and their modeling, what if they expected a real rate of return of getting into athletic apparel of 8% over 10 years on this new project? Well, if their expected rate of return is 8% and the real rate of interest in the economy is, say, 5%, then obviously it should make sense for Nike Corporation to, to go ahead and, and, and start that new project. I'd, well, a quick question might be, like, what if, what if Nike Corporation already had the money they needed? So let's assume they needed that $100 million to get the project started. What, what if they already had the $100 million? Do they still need to weigh the 8% expected rate of return versus the 6% or 5% uh, real rate of interest? And the answer is yes, and it's a simple reason why, because a lot of times students forget that the rate of interest is not only the rate at which individuals and businesses borrow, it's also the rate at which money is lent. So 
if the expected rate of return were lower than the real rate of interest, right? Even if the corporation has the money, they might as well go ahead and just lend the money at the real rate of interest, and and not take on any risk of of, of some new business project, right? So here we go. So it's, what is the meaning of R equals I? So we're going to see graphically on what's called the investment demand curve on the next slide that on the, on on our on our vertical axis that at all places where the expected rate of return is is equal to or greater than the real rate of interest that's going to show us the level of a of, of business investment at at that particular interest rate right and that'll help us graph our investment demand curve so let's now look at the next slide our investment demand curve right so here we have on the vertical axis right it says r and i like we introduced in the previous slide so that's the real rate of interest and the expected rate of return on the vertical axis from 0 to 16 going up right and on the horizontal axis we have the level of investment that will take place so this looks like our typical downward sloping demand curve right and if you remember demand we simply said demand is uh you know it shows us that inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded well here right we're not measuring price on the vertical axis this is you know the interest rate on the vertical axis but it's a very similar idea here the higher the interest rate the lower the amount of investment dollars spent on new projects per per year right so if we just pick randomly here say like so for instance at at a high interest rate of say 12% it's going to be difficult to find new business ventures new projects that are going to have an expected rate of return of 12% or better therefore right so the, the cumulative amount of, of investment that takes place it would only be 10 billion dollars for that year right so at a, at a much lower rate of say 4% right well then look there's a much greater amount of gross business investment takes place at that interest rate say 30 billion dollars right now we're several weeks away from studying monetary policy but like I've said in previous lectures it's always a good idea to start introducing concepts so we can connect ideas right, the Federal Reserve controls the nation's money supply so our central bank controls the nation's money supply and therefore they control interest rates in the economy so you can see already the relationship between the money supply and interest rates and therefore you can see how much control the Fed has over the amount of business investment that takes place so at much lower interest rates in the economy small medium-sized and large businesses are are motivated or stimulated into, into spending more on new projects so go ahead and adding a machine or buying a new piece of uh, tool or, or buying some equipment for, for the factory so if the economy is is sputtering or in a recession the feds going to want to ease going to increase the money supply to lower interest rates and stimulate economic activity right all right let's look at the um, couple reasons why the amount of investment um, that takes place every year is is not stable or not you know, the same over time, right? So back when we studied the business cycle, we said that the amount of machines and equipment and 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 uh, tools being bought, remember these are called capital expenditures. So to an economist, when we say investment spending, investment means spending money on machines, equipment, and tools, factory space, that type of thing. And once we uh, a business has has purchased these items. I, we call that capital. I goes business investment in capital. Well, the the first reason why investment does is is not level across long periods of time is simply the durability of equipment, right? So, you know, some equipment lasts a year, some lasts for you know a decade, depending on what industry you're in. So, you know, when equipment is worn out, obviously it needs to either be refurbished or replaced. But the problem for a business is that if there's not a huge demand for the good they're producing or the service they're providing even if their equipment is wearing out they may may or may not replace it and if you think about the typical firm they you know they don't have one machine or you know or, or one particular piece of equipment that performs all of their tasks right, they probably have several pieces of machinery right, so it's you know it's currently June of 2012 right now the economy 
has been recovering slowly from the Great Recession of 2007, but we're still far from uh, a rapid economic expansion. So businesses have been very hesitant, very hesitant to uh, to add to new equipment and to, and to and to put in new machines because there simply isn't a strong demand for the final goods and services that produ they're producing, right? Next idea is this irregular irregularity of innovation. So if you think about in the early 90s, like go back to like 1993, right? All across the country and really across the globe, computerization was starting to infiltrate all kinds of different industries and, and, and all kinds of different economic areas were, were learning how to, to put computerization to work within their production process. And so all businesses needed both the, the hardware to, to run the, the computers and obviously the software and, and probably some services around those softwares. So for a long time there, maybe you know a good four, five, six years across the globe, you could see innovation was making its way into the economy. Right? But you know, typically, you know, a business is going to use a piece of equipment, in this case a, a computer, up to and including the point where it's you know it, it's still relevant to them. So even if a new you know faster computer or a better operating system or some better software is available, as long as it uh, you know the current capital is is performing the job that's necessary, there's really no reason for a business to go ahead and spend on new capital, right? So until something really necessary or new comes along, there's probably going to be no investment in that particular type of technology. Right? Now, the last two are sort of here related, variability of profits and variability of expectations. Right? Obviously, profits and expectations about profits ebb and flow with the business cycle. Right? So during economic expansion, profits are strong. Right? Therefore, there's much more incentive for businesses to borrow and invest in new capital. So go ahead and buy that, you know, that next piece of, of equipment and put it in the put it to use in the factory. Right? And likewise, expectations happen around whatever's occurring in the you know in the macro economy. Alright, so this particular slide here shows the relationship between uh, real GDP over time and, and gross business investment over that same period of time. So obviously the blue curve traces real GDP from 1971 through 2007 and the red curve traces gross business investment over that same period of time so as you can see real GDP pretty much revolves somewhere between you know zero to to, to uh, and a height of the one time six six percent percent economic growth but but it traces along our, our long run average of about three percent so of about three percent real GDP growth growth over that time. Right now, the gross business investment curve obviously is much more volatile, with huge upswings and downswings. And you can see that whenever gross business investment is increasing, it obviously pulls the, up the level of of GDP and and vice versa. Right. So the question is, you know. Number one, why is gross business investment so volatile? Well, we just went over this in the previous slide, right? For all of those you know, those four reasons we, we just examined, right? businesses only invest in new equipment or new machines or new factories, right? Or buy additional tools. To, for, right? They only buy capital when they believe that profits will be strong or if profits are strong to begin with or there's strong expectations about future economic growth. So that's what really drives gross business investment. And now you can see in a, in a picture form how gross business investment drives the economy. All right, so this is finally, you know, last, last slide of this particular lecture. This is simply gross investment as a percentage of GDP for selected countries, right, in 2008. And, and this really is an important size. So okay, if we say, okay, as a percentage of our, of our total economic output, total economic output, Right. How much of that is put into gross business investment? Right. So for the United States, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of it looks like 18 percent. Right. And you can see, you know, the United States is pretty much on par with Germany, which, in my opinion, would would be strong uh, economic support for the idea that 
we are dedicating the correct amount of resources towards capital investment because Germany is a good example of a country that strong manufacturing, strong, strong, strong economy over the last two or three decades.